Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sermon this day comes to us from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 15. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Jesus is a bit out of character for what we kind of think of him. A cold, cruel man who does not answer this woman a word and only at her continued insistence does he finally give in. Well, that's certainly not the Eighth Commandment way to look at this. That's something of a worst construction. But what is, what is taking place? When I read this, I think of, of a teacher I had back in high school. And I would have sworn that this teacher didn't like me at all. He was always asking me whatever answer it was. When no one else would raise their hand, Doug. And I actually didn't like him very much at all. It took several months of this, what I thought as abuse, before I came to realize he was pushing me. He was pushing me to tell him the things that he'd taught me pushing me to tell him the answer that he knew I knew, but I wasn't sure about. He was actually being a mean teacher because he wanted me to learn. And I think very much that Jesus here is being the mean teacher because he wants us to learn. Jesus has just been confronted by the scribes and the Pharisees concerning hand washing. And he has called them hypocrites, saying that they are teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. And so he heads north, away from them, to the Gentile territory of Tyre and Sidon. And in this land of the Gentiles, a Canaanite woman comes to Jesus, crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. It probably doesn't strike us as very surprising. But in the first century they would have heard, A Canaanite, a woman from the Canaanites, these were those idolatrous people that were living in the promised land whom God had told Israel to destroy. Even Abraham made his servant promise that he would not let Isaac marry a Canaanite. Yet this woman comes to Jesus and calls him Lord, which could be just simply an honorific title, just being very respectful. But then she calls him Son of David. She recognizes his authority. She recognizes that he is the Messiah. A Canaanite woman. A Canaanite woman recognizes what the scribes and Pharisees could not see. Her daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. She is desperate. 
which he is convinced that Jesus can help her. And so she is continual in her pleas. And yet Jesus does not answer her a word. She is so persistent. The text even tells us the disciples came to Jesus begging him to send her away. Now they're asking him to send her away. And Jeffrey Gibbs in his commentary, and I I actually tend to agree with him on this. The phrasing very likely means that they were saying, give her what she wants so that she'll go away. They're not saying, you know, kick her out of town. They're just saying, just do it. Just do it, Jesus. Get it done and over with so she can leave and we can go on our way. His response to them, but is overheard by the women, the woman, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so he's explaining to the disciples why, why he hasn't healed the woman's daughter. She has no standing as a child of Israel. He's challenging some of their preconceived notions. The woman, she continues, she begs Jesus. She kneels in front of him, continually kneeling in front of him to say, Lord, help me. And Jesus responds with this unexpected statement. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. In a sense, he's saying, I'm not here to start a ministry in Tyre. I'm not here to do miracles. But what doesn't come across in our English translation is the word that's used for dogs. It's a diminutive. You have the word for dog, kuon. But then we have here in the text a diminutive, kunarios, a little dog. A puppy, a household pet. No, she's not one of the children. But she's not a wild hound wandering in off the street. And she picks up on this. She says, yes, Lord. She confesses that he's right. She says, absolutely, checkmate, that's exactly what I want. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. You are feeding the children, in effect, she says, and children always spill crumbs, and all I want, all I want is a crumb. Feed your children, be the son of David, and I will receive a crumb. He's pushed her so that she could tell him the thing that everyone else was supposed to know. That Jesus Christ is the Savior. And even the smallest crumb from him brings life and salvation. O woman, great is your faith, says Jesus. It is done here is the crumb, your daughter is healed, freed from her oppressive demon. Jesus coming, it means crumbs, it means bread, it means life for the world. When we confess that we are sinners, we confess that we're kind of crummy. It's a play on words that came into my head. Yes, we are sinners. And we are in need of these crumbs. We, like the Canaanite woman, need the salvation, the forgiveness that falls from his table. In sin, I come asking for help. I have no right, no standing to demand anything of Jesus. I deserve nothing from him. 
neither do any of us as sinners. I am demon tormented and sorely oppressed by Satan. He does not leave me alone. Indeed, he succeeds in getting me to sin. He turns things upside down in my mind. Sometimes he makes evil look good. Sometimes he makes good look worth not doing or even wrong. The devil tormented this Canaanite woman and her daughter, and he torments me, and he torments you. He gives you no rest. He leads you into sin, and then he torments you with how to hide that sin, how to cover it up. I am a beggar, and I am in need. I cannot solve my problems. I cannot get myself out of this predicament. I cannot free myself from the grasp of Satan. I cannot stop his torments. I cannot get rid of my sins. I cannot get myself into heaven. And none of you can do any of these things either. You too are in need. You too are beggars. I beg of a God who by every right should answer me with silence. Like the Canaanite woman, I deserve no answer. I beg from a Lord who should do to my sin, send me empty away. Like the Canaanite woman, I deserve not his gifts. I deserve wrath and condemnation. You, in your sin, have no standing, no right to claim or demand or even ask anything of the Son of God. You deserve, by your actions, nothing but death and condemnation. But what we deserve is not what we get. The Canaanite woman cries, have mercy on me. She trusts that the Messiah is merciful. And she is right. She begs of the right person. But there's no point in begging from the one who has no mercy. But when we beg from he who is all merciful, we beg of the right man. And so do I. I beg that the son of David would have mercy on me, and he does. He went to the cross. He suffered all things to take away those sins that make me so undeserving. And you too, brothers and sisters, when you cry to God, you cry to the one who is merciful. He is a God of grace, a God whose chief Quality is love, the God who died for you. But we also beg not only of one who is merciful, but one who is able to help. The woman comes to Jesus knowing that he can do this thing, she asks. Lord, help me. Yes, not only is God inclined to help me, but he is able. He is a God of power and might. He is a God who hears prayers and answers them. Our God, my brothers and sisters, is able to help you. He hears your prayers when you cry out to him, Lord, help me. Your begging is well placed. Jesus hears and answers and is able to to help. And we beg of a Messiah whose help, whose mercy, whose love is boundless. For the crumbs continually fall. And the crumbs have fallen on us. We have taken them within ourselves, in word, in sacrament, so that we are no longer the little house puppy. But we have been made his children, 
All we need is a crumb. Every crumb contains the mercy and the grace of God. Every crumb heals. Every crumb satisfies. Every crumb forgives. And these crumbs fall to you. They are abundant and never-ending. They feed lost sheep and lost dogs alike. Now, household pets, dogs, cats, what have you, they love little children because children in high chairs are messy and there's always food that falls to the floor. Such children are even entertained by intentionally dropping this food and watching the dogs eat it. Dogs live, and those that live in such a home are indeed lucky. And we are blessed by the abundant crumbs that come cascading down from our master's table. We beg of a Savior who gives us everything, who gave his life on that cross, who paid for our sins, and the bread that falls from the table into our mouths is nothing less than his own body and blood. We beg of a God who has crumbs enough for the whole world, he desires to feed the world with the bread of life. He wants to feed every lost and hungry sheep, every lost and hungry dog, every lost and hungry demon-oppressed soul. And now that we are children, these crumbs that fall from us, well, that is our ministry to share in the world, to tell them of Christ Jesus of his boundless mercy and love. He sometimes pushes us in his silence that we might cry all the more. That those who would say, why do you have faith in this man in the sky? Might, through his love and our persistence, Come to know that he has come not just for those who, those who come to church. Might not just come for those who were born into Christian families. But that he comes for all. We are beggars like the Canaanite woman. We beg from the son of David. And he is merciful. He is able. He hears and he grants our prayer. And he gives to us unending crumbs. He gives freely the crumbs of his word and the crumbs of his sacrament. And every crumb has the power of God. Every crumb heals. Every crumb feeds. Every crumb gives us life. And normally I conclude the sermon... with the words of, of the apostles. And before I do so today, in light of, of this last week, of the pain and the division that we've seen within our country, of the, of the violence that takes place around the world and even here, in a world that does not seem to have peace, I was reminded of an ancient custom an ancient custom that in many churches has come to be known as the, as the holy howdy, the sharing of the peace, has been misunderstood often to be just an act of welcoming, to be a, a, an opportunity to say, hi, how are you? And that is a good thing for us to be welcoming. But this sharing of the peace has a deeper, greater meaning. It is not just a, a holy hello, but it is, it is speaking peace. Peace to one another. For God has made His peace with us by Christ Jesus. And we are called, we are compelled by the new man to make peace with one another. 
in the ancient church, this sharing of the peace, this kiss of peace, was practiced before the Lord's Supper. Because as God has forgiven us, we then forgive one another. And in what has happened this week, brothers and sisters, I'd like us to share the peace, to speak that peace to one another, not just a word of greeting, but a word of fellowship, a word of unity in He who has given us His peace. So brothers and sisters, the peace of God which passes all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And let us now then share with one another the peace of God. And may the peace we share here this day be shared then throughout all the world. Let us rise. God's peace to you. Peace to you, brother.